Welcome everyone and uh, thank you for attending the first webinar in our series about the future of Alberta policing. My name is Doug Dirks and I will be your moderator today. Now before we begin I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. As you hear from our panelists we invite you to submit your questions anytime using the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. It's as simple as typing in the question and hitting the send button. Now following the presentations, I'll relay your questions to our panelists and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can within the 30 minute time frame. Now, our session this morning will unpack the national perspective. The RCMP contract uh, police model has been in place about 100 years and all across our country, different jurisdictions are reconsidering the approach. Our speakers will offer their perspective on the future of RCMP contract policing in Canada. Now, today's session panelists include Dick Fadden. Dick is an officer of the Order of Canada and a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Some of his career roles include National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister, Deputy Minister of National Defence, and Director of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Welcome, Dick, and thank you for being with us. Now, our second speaker is the Honorable Wally Opal. Wally is a frequent guest lecturer for international policing conferences and a speaker on matters related to the criminal and civil justice systems. He's a former Supreme Court Justice, Attorney General of British Columbia, and was Commissioner of the Missing Women Commission of Inquiry. Welcome, Wally. And our third panelist today is Gary Clement. Gary is a financial crime prevention expert and advocate. He's the former national director for the RCMP's Proceeds of Crime program and the former chief of police in Coburg, Ontario. Over 34 years in policing, Gary worked as an investigator and undercover operator in some of the highest organized crime levels throughout Canada. Thank you for joining us as well, Gary. And now I'll pass the torch to our first panelist, Dick Fadden, for his presentation. Thank you, Doug. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk about what I think is a really important national issue. So from my perspective, formulate how I'm thinking about this through the following question, which is, can one long-standing organization, however competent, be reasonably expected to effectively provide the full range of police services expected by Canadians in 2022 and beyond in an environment that is ever more complex and demanding? For a variety of reasons, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, I don't think so. Uh, and I believe this is the case from both the federal and the provincial perspective. So from, again, my perspective, it is in the national interest, broadly defined, that we rethink how police services are delivered in Canada. First of all, at least from my perspective, I want to be clear on one point. This is not about the RCMP, present or past, good or bad, but about the forces, role, mandate and responsibilities for the future. Uh, I spent a couple of years when I was still working worrying about the machinery of government, about how things are organized, and if there's one thing that I retain from that, there is no perfect model for a particular point in time that will meet the requirements of every single party. I don't think it's possible to find that model. What we need to do is to take into account changing circumstances and modify the current model as best we can. So let me set the scene just a little bit by briefly describing in very, very broad terms the world of policing today as a non-police officer would do. First, under the Constitution, provinces have jurisdiction and responsibility for frontline policing. That's not up for debate, uh, and it has always been the case. It doesn't matter who delivers the service, the provinces carry the can. I think one of the things that we need to remember as we work our way through this issue is how the provision of a provincial service, a provincial responsibility by a federal entity confuses accountability. It confuses accountability in a time when such things are much, much more important than they were 30 or 40 years ago. Um, I may come back to this, but I think the example of what's happening in Nova Scotia in the, with respect to the inquiry regarding the mass shooting there is a good example of that. The feds are basically left to do everything else. Drugs, borders, terrorism, espionage, trafficking, foreign corruption, cyber, most cyber things, international issues, and money laundering. In both cases, I would argue, federally and provincially, the criminal environment is much, much more challenging than it was the case when the current policy or current practice of 
contract policing was put into place, was introduced. Equally important, I would argue, is that the social and the political environment in which policing has to operate is much more complex than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. Accountability requirement, the tendency towards greater litigation, the number of stakeholders that the police have to deal with takes up much, much more time and energy than it ever has. And I think it's fair to say that these issues, accountability, litigation, and stakeholders vary a great deal across the country. And one of the difficulties with the current model, which is highly centralized in some respects, is that it doesn't take into account these variations uh, across the country. So if in the past it was possible that the forces personnel could easily be shifted between federal and provincial roles, I don't think that's the case anymore. Uh, I remember after 9-11, the force shifted a significant number of people from provincial policing to federal policing to deal with international terrorism. It was probably the right thing to do at the time, but it took people who, for example, were policing in Red Deer and asked them to start dealing with such an entirely different and complex range of issues that I'm not sure it was even fair to the officers involved. So I, I will come back to this theme, which is that policing today is far more specialized than it used to be. It requires more training, more experience, more education. And the kinds of training and experience that's required federally and provincially are different. Uh, and I don't think that it's very easy for the current model to take this uh, into account. And I would also say, just to be clear and upfront, people who deal with federal policing tend to look, look down their nose at provincial policing. I think it is just as demanding as federal policing, but it is materially different. And that's one of the things that the current model has some difficulty uh, accommodating. So if one of the traditional arguments in favor of leaving the RCMP mandate as it is, that's to say the ability to move staff, uh, and resources, uh, I don't think it applies anymore. Uh, true bodies wearing a badge or carrying a warrant can be moved, but in 2022, I, I don't think that's enough. Any police officer today who's being asked to do something, I think it's reasonable for the officer and for Canadians to expect that he or she has been trained fully to do that. You cannot take somebody who is working, and this is my sort of ubiquitous pr provincial and municipal place, lower mandible Manitoba, as complicated as that may be, and expect them to all of a sudden be competent to deal with espionage or money laundering. Similarly, if you have somebody in Ottawa or elsewhere who has spent his or her life dealing with espionage, it's not fair to take that person and move them to Alberta, to a rural community in Alberta, and expect them to be able to function easily. So this question, I think, of specialization is one that we cannot dismiss, and I think is very, very important. It's important at all levels, uh, and I think it's only going to be more important if effective policing is going to be to, to be delivered. So I would argue that this relate this raises a related issue, uh, and that is the current boss, the current commissioner of the RCMP's span of control and accountability. While there's certainly some delegation to local commanders, in a quasi-military organization like the force, the buck stops with the commissioner. I'd just like to take a half second and make the point that the RCMP is a closed personnel organization. You go in as a constable and you hope to become commissioner. This results in some resistance to change, some resistance to outside influence and outside direction. And if I'm right, and if many other people are right in saying that the current model isn't working, I'm not sure that fiddling on the margins will be possible easily because of this intrinsic resistance on the part of the RCMP to change. So I would argue that you need to make, you need to pop the clutch in a manner of speaking and make a significant change mandated by legislation if you're going to make a difference. So in theory, if you think about it, the commissioner is accountable to the federal minister and 11 provincial ministers and a variety of municipal councils. I understand that in the modern world, matrix accountability structures are the norm, but this complex sort of 
array of accountability that is vested in the commissioner makes accountability at the very minimum unclear and difficult to understand. I come back to the issue of the, the Royal Commission in Nova Scotia. And in an era where accountability and transparency is increasingly important in Canadian democracy, it seems to me that all this does is obfuscate an increasingly important issue, something we have to do something about um, if we're going to move uh, forward. Equally important, I think, is the issue of recognizing the fact that Canada is a federation. What does a federation mean? It means that its various component parts are different from one another up to a point. And this means, I think, that while there's some flex uh, in contract provinces for the local provinces to make some changes, the basic structure of the force, which in the end is a federal entity, is impossible to shift. I'm not sure that the model, the RCMP model based on training at depot and the various things that they are required to do and think about apply equally across the, the, uh, the country. So there's an old saying to shift again to another issue, good fences make good neighbors. Uh, I think the same applies in this country to federal provincial relations. Frontline policing, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, was constitutionally the responsibility of the provinces, yet it's provided and funded up to 30% by the feds. Municipalities fit in there somewhere. If funding is the critical issue, uh, the feds can assist through existing general transfer agreements. But I would argue that in general, the federation would benefit if each of the levels, federal and provincial, operated within their own jurisdiction, providing their own services. It's, it's hard to make this statement overly generally but I think it's a good model to follow. If the provinces are responsible, they should deliver the services and they should fund them, uh, recognizing again that there are the equalization payments that obtain throughout Canada. So I think that issue is also one that we need to think about. If more funding is required, you can use the federal spending power, but not to subsidize funding in the provinces when there's, even with this additional funding by the federal government, a great deal of dissatisfaction in virtually every contract provinces with the level of services that are actually delivered. As to the force itself to the RCMP, and I want to stress again, this is not a let's be critical of the RCMP exercise, but like any institution that has existed for a while, it has accumulated traditions, culture, ways of doing things. As I mentioned earlier, they're not easy to change especially true in a quasi-military organization like the RCMP. So if Alberta or Saskatchewan or British Columbia want to have greater control of what they're doing, I think asking the RCMP to deliver is very, very difficult, both, both because of the cultural issue that I just mentioned, but also because of the legal structure that results in the fact that the, the RCMP is a, a federal institution. If we want to develop a new model, which Alberta is contemplating, and I know some of the other provinces are well are, are prepared to do, we may well end up with a model that's slightly different than the current one, as opposed to the provinces enacting their own provincial force. But I think this will be very difficult to do, given the cultural predisposition, predisposition in the Mounties not to change. So I think virtually everything that I've said points uh, to reasonably asking what would the federal benefits from to end contract policing, at least as we know it today. I think that's where we, we come down. Making a change in the machinery of government is painful. It doesn't matter how hard you try, it's very difficult to do and it's costly over time. So let me shift slightly and ask to do what I would do what I was asked to do, which was think about things a little bit from the federal perspective. Um, there are real advantages from the federal perspective to use the current model. Um, you can use contract contract uh, resources in emergencies like summits or VIP protection protections. But to state the obvious, and I think this is something that we mustn't lose track of, all of the provinces could go to contract to go to create their own provincial forces tomorrow, and this would not in any shape, way, or fashion change the requirement for coordination and cooperation between themselves and the RCMP. 
creating a force in Alberta doesn't mean that all of a sudden they can ignore the RCMP or any other provincial force. And those who argue that this will have an impact on coordination and cooperation may be right, but I think it's all fixable. So what are a couple of other advantages to the federal government? I think the easier, the argument often made, it's easier to share intelligence. You have a single force. This may be true, but it can also be fixed if you have effective re relationships and agreements between various forces. One of the other arguments that the force uses itself is that the RCMP provides for a federal presence in a whole variety of areas across the country where there are none. Well, that may be true, uh, but if the Federation is relying upon RCMP detachments to provide proof of the federal existence, then we're in deep, deep trouble. Having said all of this, uh, I think that the one clear downside trumps all of these which is the lack of focus and attention resources given to the requirements of federal policing. I'm looking at this from the federal perspective right now. There's a contract between the federal government, between the Mounties and the provinces, and whenever there's a demand for resources, there's a tendency to shift them to the provincial side, and the federal, the federal side has suffered a great deal. And I don't need to tell anyone to, uh, to say also that despite valiant efforts on the part of everybody, it is very difficult to meet all of the commitments that the force makes to the provinces. So somewhere in there, there's a fundamental flaw in the system that both the pro that sees both the provinces and the federal government not get what they want out of the system. And I say this in, from the federal perspective, and I'm almost finished, by saying that federal police, is, if anything, becoming more complex than, than provincial policing. They need a different kind of people. They need a different kind of mindset. Not better, different. So let me close by saying that, from my perspective, both from the provincial level and the, and the federal level, the current model is not working as well as it should. It may well have worked in the past, but the requirements for change to deal with increasing technology, uh, difficult accountability models, and a whole variety of other issues means that we need to contemplate a system whereby frontline policing and federal policing both get the attention that they want, um, and they're not getting under the current model. So my, my conclusion is that uh, if Alberta is going down the path of creating its own police force, I think that's the thing to do. But they cannot assume if they're doing this that anything less than full cooperation and coordination with other police forces in Canada, and for that matter in the world, is anything on of their decision to create uh, a new force. So Doug, I'll stop there. Dick, thanks for sharing your perspective with us today. And attendees, please remember to post any questions uh, for Dick inside the Q&A box ahead of our 30-minute session following our two other panelists. And our next presenter today is the Honorable Wally Opal. Wally. Thank you, Doug. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you for what you said uh, about cooperation and coordination. Uh, they are fundamental, of course, in any model of policing because police forces have to share information and coordinate themselves with other police agencies. I saw that in um, spades when I did the Picton inquiry into missing and murdered women, where police agencies failed to share and failed to coordinate information that resulted in a, non, uh, a number of deaths that ought not to have taken place. So I think the first thing we have to do is look at our changing world and why we need to change the model of policing that Alberta now has. We have a huge change in demographics. The population makeup of Canada has changed. Huge number of people come here from other nations that don't understand our system of policing in a democratic society. There's also the technology, the cell phone camera that's ubiquitous. There isn't a controversial issue that that takes place anywhere that isn't filmed by some bystander. That impacts on the area of accountability, the accountability to the public. As well, the, the, there's a greater demand by the Canadian public to hold our institutions to greater accountability and more transparency. Also, in my view, there has not been enough critical analysis of policing in Canada. We've grown comfortable with the type of policing that we've had, 
and the politicians are particularly have been comfortable and there hasn't been any real meaningful reform. So I think the time is, is now apt that we ought to do this. And I commend the province of Alberta for what it's doing. Specifically, I commend the province for taking steps to establish a provincial police force replacing the RCMP. Now, the issue is complex. I agree with what Doug said. But I'm going to tell you that, that Alberta needs to have its own police force. There is fundamental, there's, there's fundamental, uh, fundamentally wrong where a provincial police force such as the RCMP is governed from Ottawa. I think it's, it's wrong uh, for that police force that's attempting to get involved in community-based policing and all the provincial priorities to be governed from Ottawa. And I think that's going to be far too difficult for the RCMP to change. And so I agree with Doug that the system now requires a wholesale change. So I commend the province for taking steps to establish its own police force. The real policing decisions in Alberta uh, with the provincial police force are made in Ottawa. The Solicitor General uh, in, in uh, Alberta, uh, Solicitor General Chandro, is responsible for policing and public safety within the province. Yet it's the federal Solicitor General who governs the provincial police force. That's wrong. Those decisions about provincial police force and the priorities and the concepts of what takes place in communities in the province ought to be made by the provincial police force who is mandated under the constitution by our rules and customs to be the person in charge of provincial police force. The final decisions um, regarding provincial policies are often made in Ottawa, particularly when it comes to fiscal accountabilities. Those decisions ought to be made locally. We live in a, in a society that demands local, local accountability, and those decisions are still being made in Ottawa, notwithstanding the fact that the RCMP assumes the role of a provincial police force. I'm going to speak now for the concept of civilian oversight, the um, accountability of policing, the accountability of our institutions to the public. Any decision regarding police accountability must be, must be made by an independent tribunal. In any democracy, the police conduct must be determined and judged by independent transport, transparent uh, bodies. The police can't investigate themselves, can't judge their uh, own uh, uh, acts by themselves, and that's what's really being done when the uh, provincial, when the federal police force, the RCMP, is involved. In uh, 1994, I was appointed to conduct a commission of inquiry into police in British Columbia. We made a number of recommendations. Our terms of reference were wide, but perhaps the most salient and most important decision we made had to do with the establishment of an independent complaint commissioner, someone who was appointed by the provincial legislature as a legislative officer, reporting to the, to the legislature, independent in every sense. That officer would have the right and the responsibility to, uh, con to do investigations of police. As I said a moment ago, the police can't investigate themselves as they do now. So in 1998, the province enacted a new police act, and that established a independent complaint commissioner who has the authority to oversee all public complaints. The difficulty is that the RCMP refuses to come to be participating in that complaint process. So the RCMP has its own complaint system. So the province of British Columbia is in this very difficult position where we have two systems of public accountability, two systems of public complaints. That just is not acceptable. You can't do that. You have a provincial police force, the RCMP, who have done a great job operationally, I think, in the province, but the times have changed. The, 
as I said a moment ago, the public wants accountability and it's fundamentally wrong to have the police investigating themselves and the RCMP for reasons only known to themselves refuses to take part in the provincial police system. In, uh, I was the attorney general in, uh, in uh, 2007, 2008, when uh, Robert Chikansky was tasered to death at the Vancouver International Airport. The RCMP uh, were the police force that was involved. They investigated themselves very quickly and exonerated themselves very quickly. It was soon discovered by the ubiquitous cell phone cameras that were present uh, everywhere that the, that, the, that the evidence that was given by the RCMP, the account that was given by the members of the RCMP was clearly wrong. It was at odds with all the facts. So, so an independent commission of inquiry was established and I appointed Tom Bradu, the former judge of the Court of Appeal. And the result was that we had a lengthy inquiry into into police accountability and the errors that were made and the exoneration that was made by the RCMP. It was a classic example of why we need independent forces of uh, investigation that that conduct uh, uh, th that deal with the conduct of our policing. Policing is far too important to be left to the police, and uh, so. It is for that reason that I think that those reasons that I think that the RCMP needs to become accountable uh, to provincial uh, oversight provisions, but we know that's not going to happen. And for, for that reason, I think Alberta is on the right track of um, establishing its own police force that would be accountable to local policing authorities and local forms of oversight. The um, so the result now is that in British Columbia, an all-party committee of the legislature has recommended that the establishment of an independent police force for the province of British Columbia replacing the RCMP. And that, I think, is a move that's long overdue. And my criticism here is not to the, uh, uh, directed at the uh, many committed officers who do policing on our streets. Uh, there's no doubt that many of them are committed to the, uh, the priorities of, um, of uh, the citizens of British Columbia and the communities that they police, but it's the system itself that needs to be corrected. And Doug has pointed that out, so I'm not gonna repeat what he said. The system of contract policing is wrong, it's outdated, and uh, it needs to be changed. The concept of, of uh, contract policing essentially involves a community or a province entering into a contract with another police force to come in to do the type the policing it needs to do on its own. And I think that system is wrong and it needs to be changed. It had its day. The province of, El of uh, British Columbia has had the RCMP as its provincial police force since 1950. And similarly, Alberta has the same situation where the um, where the RCMP is the provincial police force. That system really has outdated, is outdated, and it's time now, I think, for Alberta to embark upon this creative position where they will have their own police force governed by the province and not governed by the uh, uh, federal government. As I said before, this is not a criticism of the many fine officers who have been involved in policing at the provincial level, but the system itself, the system of governance, which is perhaps the most important uh, element of policing, needs to be changed. And the system is now outdated, and I think Alberta is on the right track by having a, uh, having a provincial police force that has as its priorities the province's priorities as opposed to, uh, and not, not necessarily the, the priorities of the federal government. I think I've come to a close. And as I said, uh, uh, and I want to comment on one other factor, the, the federal or the provincial solicitor general in, in Alberta has made a move now to have more frontline policing. And that, again, would be governed by the province. And that, I think, is the right approach to take. 
and the right path to take. Thank you. Uh, Wally, thanks for your presentation this morning. And again, if you have any questions for Wally Opal or our first presenter today, Dick Fadden, please post them in the Q&A box. And our final presenter today on the National Perspective is Gary Clement. Gary. Gary, I think you're on mute. Okay, I think I'm here now. Sorry about there that. There you go. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Maybe go to the next slide if we may. Um, I just, so everybody puts it in perspective. Um, I did 30 years in the RCMP and, and a lot of that, I started in British Columbia. I did start in uniform, spent a very little time in uniform though and went into the federal domain um, and then had uh, basically spent pretty much the rest of my career in the federal side uh, on the ground floor of developing the financial crime program. And so I, I watched the erosion of the federal policing. I, when I was the national director, I watched over 30% of our resources being hived off. Uh, a lot of that had to do with uh, going into the meeting our contract obligations. I witnessed over and over again, the number of officers that came out of contract divisions being put into positions of authority for federal responsibilities where they really had a lack of understanding um, because we've got to recognize in this country that there is a big difference between federal policing and contract policing. And that's not to say that, and I'm a very proud ex-member, I think the RCMP uniform members do an absolute phenomenal job. It is within the scope of the culture that the RCMP has, but it, as has been mentioned, I'm a firm believer and I've worked, uh, continued working in the financial crime, cyber crime and organized crime space, working with institutions. Um, I was uh, down in the States as the national director of the Association of Certified Financial Crime Specialists where I, I got to travel around the world and talk to not only law enforcement, a lot of uh, politicians and also a lot of uh, financial sector chief personnel. And it's came back over and over again. The Canada is one of the weakest links in, as far as organized crime, transnational crime, and corruption is going. And I would suggest that corruption is increasing in our country. Canada needs to wake up as far as recognizing that we are now dealing with organized criminals that have far more resources available than what is provided to the RCMP. They have far more resources available to them than what is provided to the RCMP. Uh, the RCMP has an erosion of expertise. All this one has to do is look at the financial crime program after the integrated proceeds of crime program collapsed or was disbanded. And all of those that expertise eroded. Uh, the Cullen Commission, which I was fortunate to participate in, I believe that Justice Collins' report really shows the state of this country, not just in the province of British Columbia. And I think there's, sadly, because it was only within the province of British Columbia, a lot of other provinces didn't look at it as seriously as what I believe they should have. Had they looked at it, I can tell you Alberta, Ontario uh, would definitely have been in the same light as what we saw in British Columbia. Uh, we are looking at uh, a wholesale problem of transnational crime in the form of triads or Asian-based organized crime, which there's a total lack of understanding in this country. And um, Dick, as you well remember, they tried to do the Sidewinder investigation at, in the 90s. Um, I, I happened to be the liaison officer when we came back. I believe that was a, a systemic failure in the part of this country to have collapsed that investigation. I think it would have demonstrated the impact in this country of what we're dealing with today. So looking at the RCMP, we are dealing in a complex world. And I don't believe that people have come to the recognition of just how complex it is. Policing is now complex. Uniform policing and having been the chief of police, and I lived through the possibility of being taken over by the Ontario Provincial Police, but 
but I emphasize it still would have stayed within the provincial jurisdiction. But what, I, what I'm looking at here is having local-based policing, not governed out of Ottawa, you're able to formulate a plan which is in the best interest of policing for that community or that jurisdiction. You're able to, with your police service board, which is made up of some council or, or political or government representatives and civilians in the community, are helping the chief guide as far as administratively where they can go and helping them form or recommending partnerships. I believe today with the mental health problems that we have in this country, uh, drug problems, which everybody looks at as significant as only a drug problem, that drug problem is probably 85% caused by mental health issues. Those are the type of things that is really not 100% a policing issue, but the way it's treated today, it is a policing issue. We need responsive policing that focuses on a community that has jurisdiction and oversight from a certain geographic region, not the federal government. And I, I you know, I wrote on and I've, I've done a number of interviews on what's happened in Port of Peak. And I, you can believe it or you don't believe it, but um, I can tell you the appearance of interference on the part of the federal government. And I say it's appearance because it's, it's still open for debate as sort of a he said, she said. But if the public doesn't recognize how damning that is as far as having a responsive police department and dealing with a major catastrophe in this country and what the ramification even of the appearance of having an appearance for the sake of legislative change, I think it's time for an awakening for all of us. We're dealing in a whole new world today um, in my current role as a chief, or chief anti money laundering officer in a bank, the amount of money that's coming through this country is scary to say the least. The amount of unaccountable money that's coming through without an oversight and jurisdiction. And I use the example we created what I've deemed a Rolls Royce, which is FinTrack. It's a phenomenal organization gathering data. We keep, the federal government keeps talking about having all that data, more and more organizations pumping into FinTrack. Who's investigating it? Should our assessment of our effectiveness not be prosecution and enforcement? And so what I'm bringing this down to, the province of Alberta has, for the most part, done a an effective job in this policing. The RCMP is a very proud organization. Its members are very proud and they've done a great job within the confines of the culture they're operating in. But we can no longer afford to have one police service doing the type of policing in all areas and have effectiveness. We really need to have a structured program in, in, in federal policing in my view. We need to have uh, our contract policing have enforcement uh, oversight within the province or the municipality. And the only way that's going to happen is if we take this opportunity, and I laud what the Alberta government is doing, because I think it's time that all of us in Canada look at what are the needs? What is it that we want with law enforcement? And I use the example of the, the FBI in the United States. And I was involved when I was back in Ottawa with some pretty significant investigations. And Dick, you well know when we had, then we ended up with the Arar inquiry and the Almalki and Almaty inquiries. We should have been able, if we were a proper federal force with a proper federal jurisdiction, bring in expert resources from across Canada. Instead, we were forced to use available resources in Ottawa. And don't get me wrong, I said it at the inquiry, uh, we can be thankful that they were a dedicated and committed as they were, but I can tell you the majority of them at the time, if we had asked them to spell Al-Qaeda, would have spelled it five different ways. And that's where you need to have expertise. And this country needs expertise. So when you look at, if the RCMP remains as it is today, we will continue to have a force 
that focuses the vast preponderance of their resources in provinces under provincial jurisdiction and yet overridden by the federal jurisdiction. We will continue to have a failing federal responsibility and it's going to get worse in this country. We are continually being um, having negative comments by our the Five Eyes organization because of our inability. Um, all you have to do is look at it. We they even named a model of money laundering called the Vancouver model uh, that came out of Australia because of our weakness. None of this has been fixed. And that's where my concern comes in. When are we going to take this stuff seriously? And the only way I think we're going to take it seriously is that we need a total rethinking of what the RCMP is today. And if we don't do it, I think as a country, we're going to pay one hell of a price down the road. I think we're paying it now. I think we'll continue to see more transnational organized crime. We are looked at as the weakest link in, in probably all of the G8. And so we've got to get a handle on this. In province of British Columbia, the uh, number of deaths that we're experiencing, most of that drugs or the chemicals are coming out of China, going into Mexico and the gangs there then are, are manufacturing fentanyl and it's coming up to Vancouver and we're losing, I think the latest stat, Wally, if I'm correct, was 10,000 deaths so far uh, since uh, 2006. But that's happening right across the country. When are we gonna get serious about taking on organized crime? And then you look at it and say, well, what, what does that have to do with contract policing? And I would suggest to you, it has a lot to do with contract policing. If you've got a strong, effective federal force, you can have effective contract policing focusing on what they should be focusing on. And that's what we need. The other thing, and I, I published an article on it, um, we had three major organized crime cases that got thrown out of court this past year, or in the past three years. Three major organized crime cases. Having run them, I can tell you, probably each one of those cost between three and $5 million. And the criminals walked away. They continue to operate. So when are we going to, and if the public doesn't understand how this is so impactful to them, and that what the province of Alberta is trying to do is actually, I would suggest, is having the federal government rethink what the RCMP should be, or if the, RC, or if the government isn't, they should be, because it's time that we really look at what's it going to take to make this an effective law enforcement agency and then what's it going to take to have effective policing in our province and municipalities and the only thing that i can say and having worked in a uh a standalone police department you get effective policing because the chief is accountable to the taxpayers who are accountable to a board and they have access and you're not looking at well i'll get my next promotion if i transfer to ottawa out of alberta or if I transfer here or transfer there. You're there because you want to be in the province of Alberta or in, in whatever the province is, the province of British Columbia. You're in that community because that's a community you want to police. It makes a difference culturally and for the mindset of the investigator. I think I'll leave it at that, uh, Doug, and see where the questions go. Gary, thanks for that. And this brings us to the question and answer portion of our webinar. And the first question today is for uh, Dick Fadden. Dick, um, you mentioned today that there's a need for specialization and training for federal policing mandate due to the complexity of the work. In your experience as director of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, CSIS, and as the National Security Advisor, has the RCMP acknowledged that placing good frontline policing members into federal mandate policing, for example, after the 9-11 attack is not appropriate? Well, uh, directly, no. I, I don't think if I can make my, what I think will be my only direct criticism of the RCMP, but like a lot of organizations of its type with closed personnel system, admitting that they, are not anything but picture perfect it comes with great difficulty to them. So no, I don't think they have acknowledged that the shifting of resources into complex areas of federal policing is, is a potentially a mistake. 
I do think, having said that, there is an acknowledgement within the force and more broadly that if it's the sort of thing that can be avoided, it should be avoided. But more telling, I think, is they haven't done anything concretely from a management or for an organizational perspective to try and deal with the issue. So it's, it's an incomplete and imperfect answer, but no, I don't think they've acknowledged it directly. But more to the point, while trying to avoid it if they can, uh, I don't think they've done anything concretely uh, to deal with the issue. Uh, Wally, this next question for you. Uh, is it policing or is it a combination of judiciary that needs an overhaul, in particular B Bill C-75 bail reform? If we're always catch and release with criminals, what does it matter what color stripe there is on a constable's pants? Well, I, I think any any uh, organization and the court system itself is uh, not immune to criticism. So I'm not going to come here and tell you that uh, the judicial system in Canada is perfect. It has its weaknesses. It has its strengths like like anything else. If you're if you're asking me that uh, does the judicial system need fixing, uh, I, I don't know how I can answer that question except to say that that um, all of us uh, we we need to we're all of us are in this together. While the judges need to be independent, they have to decide decisions based on the law and the evidence that they have have uh, before them. That does render them uh, render a lot of criticism towards judges. But you know what? Uh, our system is uh, uh, can withstand criticism. I think in many ways our overall system is the best in the world. So so no system is perfect and. Uh, it requires criticism and constructive criticism. Now, I'm not quite sure who this question uh, would be most appropriate for, so let me just throw it out there if someone has a perspective. If we move to a provincial police service, does the provincial government own a percentage of all the vehicles, equipment, buildings, etc., that are presently used by the RCMP contract policing in Alberta? Anyone have any perspective on that? Well, I think what's happening in, in Surrey is that maybe an example because the city of Surrey has uh, embarked upon establishing its own police force. So they have now their, some of their own police vehicles and with the Surrey police logo on it. And, uh, and there are RCMP vehicles there as well. So it appears that the answer to that question is that, that uh, both parties, Surrey would have its own police force or have its own police vehicles and own equipment, uh, but that doesn't mean that the RCMP uh, doesn't have its. Right now, they have a system where they're co-policing, and uh, the RCMP is slowly uh, dis disengaging itself from Surrey, and so they they are using both police vehicles depending on what force the officer is in. Uh, Wally, this question is directly for you, uh, and it says, you stated that moving to a provincial police model will greatly improve public accountability and transparency oversight. Um, why can't the Alberta Police Act be amended sufficiently to allow the RCMP be under provincial oversight and accountability? That's an excellent question. Um, I think if the RCMP chose to come into uh, that model, it would be good. Uh, but I can tell you that in British Columbia, after we recommended that the RCMP be a part of the provincial complaint system, we refused to do so. Uh, they rely on their own system of complaints, uh, which is really governed by an advisory committee, the review board. But uh, no, that's a uh, that's been a controversial issue here in British Columbia, and uh, it's one that I've been critical of the RCMP for for not coming in to the provincial system, even though they're the provincial police force. Uh, next question for Gary Clement. Uh, oh, go ahead, Dick. Um, I, I'd just like to add to what Wally has said. I don't think it's entirely the RCMP who are unenthusiastic about participating in provincial oversight uh, bodies. There's a generally held view in the federal government, uh, including by the Department of Justice, that provinces may not investigate the federal government. And it's a broad constitutional principle held by most people in the federal government. So I, I think uh, I agree with Wally that they, the Maldives certainly don't want to participate themselves. But I just wanted to say, to be fair, I think it's a generally held view in the federal government 
that no federal entity should be subject to provincial oversight or review. It just complicates it even more, perhaps. You're absolutely right, that I, but the fact is there's nothing preventing the federal government and or the RCMP changing. I mean, uh, look, the, the provincial governments are now sending a signal to the federal government and to the RCMP that if you're not going to adhere to our standards, then we're going to get our own police force. Simple as that. That's what's happening in British Columbia, and that's what's happening in Alberta. Uh, Gary, this one's for you. You said that uh, the RCMP endeavors to be all things to all people, uh, federal, provincial, territory, municipal, and VIP protective services, and that the complexity of policing does not allow for the RCMP to be effective in policing over this spectrum of services. Is this not just a matter of providing additional resources to fulfill all mandates? I, you know, and that's something, and I, I know Dick was in government long enough to know that some of the RCMP when continually did ask for more and more resources. It's not about resources. And, and I mean, I ran a unit where it, it comes down to the, the ability to have expertise. And because we are, are the RCMP is a paramilitary organization, you are, the only way you get uh, a salary increase other than through yearly uh, additions by the government is through promotion. And if you're in federal, uh, some of the promotions or the most promotions happen to fall into contract divisions. The RCMP has, and most, I don't know of a provincial or a municipal force that allows this, but the RCMP has a promotion system where from corporal you can bounce to inspector. And because of it, it, the whole focus, and I can tell you, I watch my units almost shut down for about three to four weeks every year with officers studying for their promotional exams and then writing an exam and then immediately looking across wherever they could get a promotion. That's what's happened at forcing the RCMP. And that's not a way. And I, I did a study when I ran the integrated procedure crime units. And I wrote to actually the commissioner of the day saying it took five years of people staying within that unit to become an effective investigator to the international level. Mm -hmm. The average I was getting was 3.2 years before they transferred out. And I made an argument that I was constantly running a training center, trying to keep people trained so they could do a partial investigative job. That's what happens in the federal sphere. And it doesn't work. It's like saying, I'm gonna take a physician tomorrow and put him in accounting, but because of the structure of the RCMP, that's what happens. And we got to understand that we're dealing with sophisticated organized crime today. And the only way you can take them on is have sophisticated policing. And you only get that through experience and expertise. Now, Gary, this question is also for you. Um, you had a long, successful RCMP career, and you've been working in the private sector for a number of years now. Did you form the view that the RCMP should get out of contract policing while you were still with the force, or did it take removing yourself from the day-to-day -day workings of the RCMP to form this viewpoint? I can tell you, and um, uh, Premier Kenny will know this uh, because I actually spoke to him, but I actually applied for the, and I knew I wouldn't get it, but I applied for the commissioner's role when uh, Polson became commissioner. And in my uh, letter to the board, I wrote that the only way that uh, I would even entertain the job is if initially the government would accept that we put a Chinese firewall up between federal and contract policing. Very similar to what happened uh, prior to security service being hived off because they're two separate mandates requiring different expertise. Uniform police officer, a, a good seasoned community policing officer is far better than trying to stick him into a, a him or her into a federal role that they know nothing about. They may be 100% of the community role, but they're a failure in the federal role. And it's not taking anything away from the ability of members. It's just their different roles. So. I, I went so far initially that we put a Chinese firewall up, but uh, watching it uh, as I did, especially after I became chief and seeing uh, how it operates on that side of the house, 
seeing how uh, federal policing got eroded, um, I came to the conclusion is, and it, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't an easy decision, but I've been advocating now and writing on it now for probably the last 18 years. It's time the RCMP got out of contract policing. Uh, uh, this could be for any of our panelists today. Uh, what makes the proposed provincial police service allow the province to address the changing and complexities of modern policing demands? I'll start okay. off and then turn it to you, Dick. Um, look, I really believe if you're going to, if the province moves ahead, which I know that's the, the way they would like it, the first thing that I would be recommending is you do, and I know they've done a study, but you do a gap analysis. You bring uh, a group of people together, uh, mental health workers, a whole nine yard, and as you set that community policing uh, force up, you make sure that you touch base with all of those areas. That's something you can do in a provincial or municipal environment. You can't do it in a federal environment. And anyways, that's why I think it is a, ends up being a better model. I'll turn it to you, Dick. We've always, we've talked about the desirability and the wish to have community-based policing. That is a proactive type of policing that deals with some of the root causes of crime and works with the citizens. Uh, I don't think that can be done with a federal government, although there are many committed officers in the RCMP who do interact with communities. But I think the Alberta model moving towards a, an independent police force is a step towards establishing a community-based police. Can I add a thought to that? Because I agree with what both my colleagues have said, but um, I'm going to bring in a, a principle of, uh, of management. Uh, you know, which applies to both the public and the private sector. When you constitute an entity, uh, be it public or private, you always give it a niche, you give it something to do. And I think one of the most difficult things to do in both the public and the private sector is to make that mission not too broad and not too narrow. Because if it is too broad, people dissipate their energies, they spend all their time trying to, make, to meet each of the requirements in all of these various categories. If it's too narrow, you end up, you know, with a mindset that's not really helpful and you find it difficult to collaborate. So I would say that one of the real advantages of creating a provincial force in Alberta is that it would allow them to focus on the things that Gary and Wally have talked about. Because from the perspective of the RCMP today, they're trying to please the, the uh, 12 masters, political masters that I've mentioned, any number of communities, they have to enforce everything from frontline policing to the Migratory Birds Act, to money laundering, to espionage, to terrorism, and I could go on for 10 minutes if I applied my mind to it. There is no ability to focus. And I, I repeat what I said when I made my initial remarks, frontline policing is not a simpleton's job. It requires focus. It requires relationships and contacts. And if they're being asked to think about too many things, it's almost impossible to deliver. So I think this is one of those principles that does apply to both the private and the public sector. And, and allowing the provincial force to focus and specialize would enable them to do the things that Gary and Wally have talked about. Um, uh, this, again, is for uh, all of the panelists, I think. Um, question is, defund the police has been a frequent public opinion during the last six years. Consequently, recruitment is difficult due to these optics. It's now not the career of choice for many current and prospective individuals. So will Alberta be able to recruit and create a force that will be rewarding and that will be part of the Alberta advantage? I think the term defund the police is so unfortunate and so misleading. I think the proponents of so-called defunding the police really mean that we need to put resources in other areas, in crime prevention, dealing with dysfunctional families and kids and people who are having difficulty so as to prevent crime from being committed. That's what I think real defunding the police. I don't think it really means that you stop funding the police. So. I think that, go ahead, Dick. Um, I, I think what Wally said is true, but I also think that um, if we do this, we can actually broaden the job description 
of police officers, because right now it's fairly narrow, not just federally, but anywhere. You know, they're there, they carry a gun, they're, they're meant to enforce the criminal law, and that's a sort of restrictive perspective. Um, I, I think you mentioned when we started, Doug, that I worked in national defense for a while, and one of the things that struck me was that um, various and sundry uh, auxiliary functions, you know, the social workers, the lawyers, and the doctors who are not in combat arms actually went into operational areas with the combat arms and did their bit. They didn't shoot the guns, but they were as intimately involved in what we did in Iraq or Afghanistan than the combat arms people. So I don't understand why we cannot have police officers who, aside from the basic skills they have today, have their job description broadened to include some social work training, for example, or some medical training. Um, and if a province were inclined to do that, I think it would be helpful. But I also very strongly agree with what Wally was saying. You have to fund other entities uh, that are involved in these kinds of activities. But I would also argue broaden the definition a little bit. I think that's excellent what you just said. Doug, I'd add, I'd add one. Oh, sorry, Wally. Go ahead. I was going to say that the police now, particularly in a place like the downtown east side of Vancouver, are encountering people with mental illness, people who are dysfunctional, people who are unemployed, homeless. So their job description now invariably involves being a part of a social worker. You're right. They are doing prevention and they're doing a lot of a lot of work that they're not necessarily qualified to do, but we we expect them to do that. It's a difficult job. I was going to add one thing, Doug, is the other thing I think is unique about having a you know, a model, a provincial model out of the federal regime. And I'll use Cobra as an example as a police service. They went to almost two-tier policing where they've got uh, special constables now. There is a lot of roles today that you don't need a fully trained police officer to, to fit into. So you can do, use, a, like you've got the sheriffs in Alberta. I think they probably make greater use of them. But there is a role for two-tier policing. And I, you know, that's something that was talked about. I remember talking about in headquarters back a number of years ago, and uh, it was almost sacrilegious when we talked about it, but the re it's reality today. Policing is expensive. So there's roles, I think, that uh, a municipal or provincial police service can do greater things quicker than under that federal regime. And I think it's time we looked at it. Otherwise, uh, this defund the police is really coming down because I've sat on where the mayor and the chief administrative officer of the municipality says, well, you do realize that policing is 45% of our budget. We've got to get a handle on this and do it effectively. And I think there is ways to do it. Uh, which leads us into the next question, which is about uh, money and management. Uh, how can we be confident that a provincial police force be efficient and effective in delivering frontline policing across the province when we're having issues with the provincially led EMS health care across the province? Well, it comes right down to hiring appropriate leadership and having an appropriate oversight board. Anyone else want to tackle that one? Well, I, I, think I think that's it's really because there are like weaknesses, apparent weaknesses in other areas of provincial governments doesn't mean necessarily mean that will happen here. I think, you know, we elect people to govern and uh, people are appointed uh, to cabinet and other positions and we have to rely on them that they'll do an effective job of uh, managing uh, policing. Uh, this question, oh, go ahead, Dick. I can add, I think my earlier point uh, about focus is, is relevant here. Uh, and I also think it's a question of attention. Um, Wally can correct me if he wants, uh, but it seems to me that in Canada, unless there's a problem, there aren't a lot of votes in policing. So it's very difficult to get premiers and prime ministers and cabinets generally to focus on the issues of policing, except when something goes wrong. Having said this, if we're starting something new, if there's a consensus that it's a good thing and we can focus, 
And I could not agree more with Gary. Who is selected as the director or the commissioner is going to be critical. Uh, and if they make a mistake on this, the whole thing will be put at some risk. But I also think some positive attention on the, uh, from our political leadership in Alberta would make all the difference in the world. And it has to be sustained. This is not a six month wonder. Um, it's not something we do well in Canada. I mean, I think if we, uh, if, you know, if we ask premiers across the country, including in Quebec and Ontario, how much they think about policing, it would not be a lot unless something has gone wrong. Thanks. Uh, Gary, uh, this one's for you. Is it not a fair statement that the top leadership uh, decision makers in the RCMP should be held to task? I believe very strongly they should be held to task. I've actually, uh, anybody that's read anything, and I did a very long global interview, um, the what's happened in Port of Peak, I honestly believe that the commissioner should resign. Um, I, I, and, and I can tell you, and uh, Dick, you're well aware of this, when I went to the Arar inquiry and the Almaki inquiry, I was the, the highest officer that took full accountability for what happened. Everybody above me had selective memory. And that's got to stop in an organization that we're supposed to be ethically and morally upright. And it's unfortunately, it's eroded and politics is winning the day and it's got to stop. Uh, this next one is, uh, I think, supplementary to one that you talked about earlier, but it's a uh, majority of drug use is a result of mental illness. Reviewing the future of policing website, it states that the Provincial Police Service will have funding and support model to provide increased mental health support with mental health specialists. Will this then allow the frontline members to focus on the contract policing mandate, crime reduction, and provide citizens with the mental health and addiction support that they deserve from specialists? Bottom line is, from my view, it will help. Uh, uh, you know, I can look at it from the sake my daughter works in the mental health field here in Ottawa and she's dealing with all kinds of various addictions and mental health issues. Um, I, you know, I use her as an example. She can uh, de-escalate a situation and, and the standard joke is they're going to form somebody, which means get them taken into a hospital to be uh, verified if they can still stay in the public safely. Uh, she's down there by herself. She's probably 105 pounds soaking wet. She calls for that because the police officer has taken in and she'll get three to five officers show up to form that person, which escalates rather than de-escalating the situation. It's called lack of understanding. And I do believe with proper education, proper training and having groups that understand how to deal with the mental health issues, it will save policing costs in the long run. It will save health costs in the long run because all we're doing now is recycling problems. Uh, Wally, I think this, uh, you may need be able to lead this one off. Uh, the Surrey transition costs have gone up significantly according to the RCMP union. Uh, can we be sure that the provincial report estimate at $366 million will not go up? I don't think there's any kind of guarantee, but I think the uh, starting point in any discussion when it comes to the Surrey police is that uh, it was going to cost more to establish its own police force. Uh, I think City Council knew that when they voted unanimously to establish its own police force. But the trade off for the higher cost is that you're going to get a police force that's locally based with a police board that uh, has local priorities. And uh, yeah, so so uh, I, I don't I think that there has to be discipline, of course, and costing and budgets and all of that. But uh, but there's no guarantee that that uh, uh, that things will manage itself properly, except that that's what we have financial manager managers for. And, and I'm sure that Surrey in establishing its own police force doesn't have an unlimited budget. They have a police board and the mayor is the chair of the police board. So I think that we have to rely on them to act responsibly. Uh, the next question is, how is the uh, provincial police service model going to implement true community police model? Well, I think that because they're the provincial police force as opposed to a federal police force is closer 
to the community, they're in better suited to get involved in local issues and with local matters. And that's what community-based policing is all about. It's a decentralizing type of policing, proactive type of policing, problem-oriented policing, and that's always done more efficiently uh, at the local level. And a provincial police force, I think, would be more amenable and in a better position to address that. Doug, Doug mm -hmm. um, can I add a thought on the previous question about resourcing? Because I, I think that's critical. Um, you know, the bottom line is for everything that Canadians want done today, there's not enough money. You know, our health costs are going through the roof. One of the things that always struck me when I was still working was the, the single interest advocates, <clears throat> be they for the police or the military or anything else, totally forgot about everything else that had to be financed. And that's going to be the reality, I think, for a new provincial force. You know, the treasurer and the premier are going to have to sort out how much money they're prepared to give. But I think one of the other advantages is a rather more indirect one, which is that I don't care what organization you're dealing with, there's all, there are always new ways and better ways and more economical ways of doing things. And with the greatest of respect to all of the really wonderful people who are working in the RCMP, that's not at the top of their agenda. It's an organization that is very proud of its history and of its ways of doing things, and they're not amenable generally speaking, I know I'm generalizing, to thinking outside the box. There are usually ways of, of saving money. I mean, it's an argument that come up, comes up all the time when we're talking about health care, of which I know virtually nothing, but I'm just listening to people. If people were prepared at the political level to take the political risk and at the management level to put some of their careers at risk, we could find ways to save money in the in the hospital system. I'm absolutely convinced the same is true on the police side. In particular, if you create a new force who are more open to new ways of doing things and new ways of thinking. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks for that, that Dick. Uh, next question, uh, this is open to anyone on the panel. Uh, within the provincial report, there's going to be 275 additional frontline police members in particular for rural and remote communities. So how will the Provincial Police Service accomplish that? Okay, I'll just add that, look, you know, I, I know right now there seems to be a, a lull in the, the ability to staff positions. One of the things though I think that's gonna be beneficial to Alberta, a lot of the people that are probably going to apply are gonna be uh, living in Alberta recognizing they're not going to have to transfer to Toronto or anywhere else. They're going to be in the province. Uh, I, I just believe that that is more attractive and will be more attractive. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. It's, um, you talk to any industry and policing is not different than any industry out there. Trying to hire people today in a lot of areas is difficult. Uh, I think you make the you demonstrate what you're trying to do and not under an old model. I think you will actually attract uh, people of a different ilk than probably what I am and a different thought process. And I believe that's a good thing. And that's what we need. We need some progressive policing with young people with different ideas on, and can help out in the community. And I believe that setting it up properly you will attract those people. It will mean very much like I see happening at conferences I've attended in the US, getting out to these conferences where university kids are, or you know, people within a, at various industries are, and actually doing, uh, trying to attract them at these areas. It can't be left to throwing an advertisement on, on, it just doesn't work anymore. So I think if you're novel and you get out there, you will get some good candidates. Policing is changing. You can't be a police officer virtually anywhere in Canada unless you have some kind of post-secondary education. And I think your point, Gary, is quite well. You advertise on, on campuses and you make the job more attractive. And uh, that's what's happening here in British Columbia where they're, they're having, there's a challenge right now, particularly with the Surrey establishment. Uh, they're going to need more police officers. Vancouver is going to lose and is losing officers to Surrey. 
So I think there may be a short-term challenge, but in the long term, uh, if you make the job, uh, the profession, and, and there's a movement now in Alberta to make policing a profession. Uh, there's a group of officers, uh, uh, Dave Castles and all of these people who are moving towards establishing a police college. And I think that's, that's a real step in the right direction. Uh, and that dovetails nicely into this next question, which is uh, the RCMP uh, has the depot in Regina for national training needs. And I've read that the Provincial Police Service will use facilities in Edmonton, Calgary, and the Solicitor General College, and perhaps colleges throughout the provinces. Uh, will this training model be sufficient? Gary? I, look, I'm a firm believer, and I think Wally's last point is something that policing has to wake up to. Um, when I was a liaison officer in Asia, I happened to go over to, I, I was allowed to go over to Taiwan. I was the first officer allowed in Taiwan. They actually have police uh, university degrees and they all go from that university. And we've got to start partnering with the university uh, institutions and we got to start bringing law, having a law enforcement degree. I, we've been fortunate on the financial crime side. I can tell you right now, there's a number of university and colleges that are now have a financial crime uh, master's program. We got to do the same for generalized policing. And so it, it's not just changing our police, uh, the police force, it's changing our whole policing model and getting into the 21st century. And that's what it's going to take. I just don't think we're proactive enough. We, we live on tradition and tradition is passe today. And we got to reflect what society is. And the only way we're going to do that is let's use our, get our universities involved. And I think we can get lots of candidates and bright candidates, probably far brighter than I am. Um, so uh, that's it for the questions this morning. But uh, I'll leave it up to each of our panelists or for one final thought. Wally Opal, let's start with you. Well, I, I think uh, I think this has been productive. I think, and I, I want to go back to what I said at the beginning. And I think that. Alberta uh, and British Columbia are doing the right thing by establishing a provincial police force, uh, particularly if we're, if we're concerned with having community-based policing and getting away from the contract policing model. So I think we're on the right, the, the, the dialogue is there, the, move, the intention to do, uh, to have a better type of policing is there. So, so I'm confident as to what will happen. Dick? Thanks. Well, uh, I too think this was was very useful. It was certainly very interesting to to participate. So just a couple of thoughts. You know, there are all, there are already two provinces that have their own police forces. I'm a Quebecer and I've lived in Ontario for most of my life. And I think most Ontarians and Quebecers relate to their provincial force in a way that they cannot and do not do with the Mounties. It's got nothing to do negative with the Mounties, but I think we already have models that work. Are they perfect? Should everything they do be exactly duplicated in Ontario? Absolutely not. But, you know, in both cases, these provinces have had their own police forces and they have worked. One of the things that is distinctive to some degree as between these two forces and the Mounties is they don't follow the quasi-military model quite as uh, enthusiastically as does the RCMP. And, I would argue that even if nothing has changed in terms of contract policing, serious thought should be given to demilitarizing the RCMP. And I, and I say this with great respect because in an environment where we give peace officers extraordinary powers, you certainly need command and control. You can't have them go out willy-nilly. But do you need a structure that's quite as similar to the military today? I don't think so. And I've been told by a number of young people whom I've met over the years that that's one of the reasons they, they did not engage, they did not ask to join the RCMP. They don't want to have, you know, an extraordinarily short haircut. They don't want to spend all their time shining their boots. I'm using idiotic examples to make my point. But if we're going to solve some of the recruiting problems uh, that we've talked about, I think we're going to have to loosen up a little bit there. I mean, even the Canadian military right now is more flexible in terms of some of these things than is the RCMP. Ain't gonna solve all of our problems, but it may help in terms of recruiting. But I, I join Wally in saying, I think Alberta is going down the right path. I hope they get through it. 
because there will be some political cost involved and probably some money costs involved. But in the end, as I tried to say in my own remarks, it's not just in the province's interest or the federal government's interest, it's in the national interest that we do this. Thanks. Gary? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna echo what Dick said. I I really laud that Alberta is doing, and I know uh, this is a, a highly emotional issue for the RCMP members and for their union but we're in a different era and we've got to get over this love of the red surge and you know I, it's an iconic model but those days are long past us uh you know dick summed it up the provincial policing is a responsibility of the provinces and you know it's sort of an anomaly the rcmp took it on at a time on the march west those days are long behind us and you know when they took it on we didn't think of having an internet and the cyber crime and all of those things that we're dealing with today. So we really, this is an opportunity, I believe for this country to do a, an adjustment, an adjustment which will benefit every taxpayer in this country if it's done right. And I, you know, I hope it's successful I, and I think it will be beneficial in the, in the long run. Thank you. And thank you, and we'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks to all the participants who submitted uh, questions today, and thanks to our panelists, Dig Fadden, Wally Opal, and Gary Clement for your presentations and insightful answers over the last uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, attendees, thanks for joining us this morning, and please watch for a follow-up email in the coming days with more resources and information about future webinars on the future of Alberta policing. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.